everyone, and thanks again for joining us at the 2023 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Michael Christian, and I'm a first-year MBA at MIT Sloan. It is my pleasure to introduce you our last panel of this year's SSAC, the last of sports. Our awesome, awesome panelists here today are Jessica Gelman, CEO, Craft Analytics Group. We also have Daryl Mori, President of Basketball Operations, Philadelphia Sixers. Nate Silver, statistician, author, and founder, 538. And Bill James, former senior baseball operations advisor, Boston Red Sox. Our panel will be moderated by Michelle Steele from ESPN. And as you probably have known by now, the panel will run for 45 minutes, and we will have 10 minutes at the end for questions. Please submit your questions at Twitter using the hashtag LastOfSports. Questions will then be selected by the moderator. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Michelle. Yes. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. We are in the home stretch of the 2023 Sloan Analytics Conference. I've got a lot of energy today, you guys, because I think we're going to get weird. Oh, <laughs> yeah, in this oh, panel. My. So the uh, title, the official title of this panel is The Last of Sports. Has anybody seen The Last of Us? Yeah, so it's just like that. <laughs> Uh, dying of a, we're dying of a fungus? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Boston in 2023. To Boston in 2023. Oh, nice. We're going to be talking about a genie, a magical genie. You know, Malcolm Gladwell was here last year. Phenomenal uh, panel discussion that he led. But one of the things that he said was, if you could wave a magical data wand over any sport to improve it in any way, what would you do? Uh, so that is the theme of today's panel. And full disclosure, I don't think you can knowledgeably forecast the future which, without having a sense of what has come before. And because I like to do extra credit whenever I can, I looked up the March 2nd, 1923, 100 years ago, sports section of the Boston Globe. Oh, this is awesome. Yes, uh, to see what they were covering in 1923. Uh, I'd like to highlight a couple items. Page one, Babe Ruth swings a mean golf club. That was their lead story. He was in Hot Springs, <laughs> Arkansas, uh, golfing. Christy Matheson gives big ovation at gathering of 300 newsboys. <laughs> uh, Matheson is, had just taken a job as president of the Boston Braves oh. in 1923. And um, MIT swimmers to clash with Brown. I looked it up. That was the last time MIT was mentioned in the sports page. <laughs> the engineers. You, feel free to boo on that one. Of course, they had the boxing and the horse racing forms. And finally, Daryl, you might be interested in this. Basketball, two words, basketball facts worth knowing. A weekly series on the new sport, relatively new sport, of basketball and the sexy headline of that weekly series uh, on March 2nd, 1923 was, How to Play Basketball. Wow. The, the first sentence was, Sleep is of prime importance to <laughs> any athlete. So, <laughs> Daryl. Well, this is a hot topic in the NBA. So. Can you believe? I can't and, believe. I, no one that, that, is a, that is a verbatim quote. Daryl, uh, first question to you How do you play basketball? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll steal Red Arbuck's line, actually. He, he had a famous thing. He said, uh, all it is, you have to put the round ball through the hoop more than the other guy. <laughs> That's what he said. Wrong. It starts with sleep. Oh. <laughs> all right, we'll loop you back. You even gave me the answer. <laughs> okay, okay. We'll loop back around to that one. So my point in starting out with this kind of like a little bit of a monologue is that history is very interesting to me because it shows you a way that life was. Like, this is not like an abstract concept that at one point boxing and baseball and horse racing were the dominant sports. Maybe one day they will become dominant again, but we know that that was the way that life was and maybe that's the way that life could be. So my question to the panelists today is, what can we do now? Say we had unlimited resources, you know, like uh, Malcolm Gladwell with his magical data wand. Um, what can we do now to help evolve the dominant sports? And what are the sports that might be dominant in the future? The, for the people who are sitting in the audience now, their lives are going to be very different uh, in 50 years. Jessica, start with you, the big four, right? Basketball, baseball, football, hockey. Are those the sports that are 
dominant in 2050? Wow. Um, I, would, I would have to say, mm. so I think the big thing in 2050 will be that sports overall will be much more global. Um, I mean, we, we've heard a lot over the course of this weekend how, how much more global the sport is becoming, in part because of player power. Um, I loved the stat that Tamika shared about how LeBron James has 7x the number of um, social media followers as the Lakers. And that his, his presence is global. And so basketball being a super global sport and, and, and had a focus on it for the past, let's call it 40 years really since uh, David Stern first made the entry into China. Like the NBA has a big head start. That said, with the NFL starting to move into international, some of the biggest challenges uh, with, the, with the NFL or with football in general is this kind of interesting. Uh, many years ago, I was part of the Patriots um, putting down, planting a seed in China. And one of the biggest concerns was the um, size of the locker rooms. And, um, hmm. you know, well. Not enough lockers for the size of the team? Yeah, so. I, Put Tom Brady's ego in, or? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, the, but, you know, the, an NFL team is what, 80 people are traveling, and that's very, is not what most uh, global sports have, even soccer teams. So yeah. there is infrastructure changes that need to happen, that will happen, because the, the way that, the, uh, that NFL or football is played is really primed for viewership, for engagement, for what's coming with gambling, obviously here in, in Mass um, on March 10th, that is going to drive increasing engagement. And as football can actually be played more, um, and, and the infrastructure changes, but like, just think about like planes and bringing you know, 80 plus people to another country, the speed of travel, all of these things that can evolve to help make sports in general more global and for people to see it. I, I, so I'm gonna go with, I think football will likely um, be dominant because they haven't really- will continue to be dominant and it'll be- Well, they're global. dominant in the United States. They are not dominant mm -hmm. around the world. I mean, soccer is, right? And, but I mean, soccer obviously will continue to grow too, but I think it, from a global perspective, I think football will increase in, in, in that regard. Bill, what about you? When you look at the big four and baseball in particular, right? Yes. Do they continue? Does baseball continue to be part of the? I'm not sure hockey's in the big whatever. Mm. In the United <laughs> States, you don't think yeah. you think that MLS oh. is bigger than the NHL? What's that? Do you think that MLS is bigger than the NHL? It doesn't matter. MLS will be bigger. Yeah. I don't know yeah. what it's bigger now, but yeah. Well, first of all, I would like to point out that on March 4, 1923, the national champion in basketball, which had been, the NCAA had not yet been founded, but the national champion in basketball as, as established by a poll was the Kansas University Jayhawks. So, <laughs> Rock talk. Rock talk Jayhawks. The, um, as, we, as we still are, although there have been a few years we didn't win. Uh, the, uh, and and they, were, they were again in first place in the polls in 1925. Oh, I did. Um, uh, 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 you mentioned boxing and horse racing. Boxing and horse racing, in my opinion, mostly slipped out of their premier spots because they, they screwed up the transition to television mm. in different ways. Mm. Horse racing is like, we don't want to be on television. It'll kill our audience. And, uh, and boxing screwed up the transition by funneling all the money into so few hands that there weren't enough people who were profiting from it. So there weren't enough people promoting it, and also they were fractious. They were hurt themselves very badly by being fractious about who was the national champion, who was the heavyweight champion, the middleweight champion, et cetera. The, um, so I would suggest that a key determinant of exactly what, which women's sport becomes really strong, will be who handles the transition in technology well. We're we're moving toward more streaming, uh, more availability of, of, well, we don't, you don't really know what the technology will be, but, but who handles that transition, how well, will be critical to what become, what emerge as the 
the dominant sports. Can I just add one more thing because, uh, on the on the streaming and the global yeah, nature? Yeah, 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 for sure. I didn't know that about horse racing and boxing, that they did not want to be on television. Yeah, the horse, horse racing did not want to be on television. Boom, you're irrelevant. A lot of our early sports didn't want to be on social media, so well, they, they corrected. But but but, uh, but just the that streaming component and being able to many people be watching the same stream, but it being delivered in different ways, I'm sure that would be some of the things that we would talk about with what AI can actually bring to bear to like real time. I mean, Maurice Donahue said yesterday about how they have a different type of a broadcast in the UK for the US Open in Roland Garros uh, as well, based on the particular location. So imagine if in real time those changes could be made. I mean, it really opens up, so it's so much. I mean, I do think soccer should not be excluded from this conversation. It's the biggest sport around the world. It's relatively popular in the U.S. with the younger generation. Um, yeah, I guess I should qualify that this is United States. We're looking at the yeah, United States. Yeah, look, right? I think one of the most shocking things that I would not have predicted 10 years ago is that MLS um, is not bigger, in part because they have this salary cap, right? We should have, like, MLS be a big five franchise right now. Let these rich hedge fund, hedge fund guys pay $2 billion for a franchise, right, and import some of the best players in the world. So we're... Um, one of the top five or six leagues internationally. Like, it's shocking that that hasn't happened. It feels like a failure of the market in some ways. Um, I mean, you can look at the current trajectories. Uh, you know, I think baseball, I like the rules changes this year. I think it's in a fair amount of trouble. Mm. Hockey, I'm from Michigan. I mean, hockey is like a big four sport in like so a third of the country. Baseball falls off. You think that MLS it's hard or, to, or a, I mean, you said three years ago, PS, in 2020, when we did a similar panel of the future on sports, you said that MLS would essentially uh, capitulate to a larger and better funded, and like you said, lack of a salary cap league, soccer yeah. league in the United States. Someone else would come in and. I'm surprised take that lunch. hasn't. I mean, again, there is such demand for like sports franchises, and the Washington Commanders are going to sell for five billion dollars. A frankly poor brand and a poorly run team, right? Um, like you're leaving money on the table by by not having like. MIFC be somewhere in that department. And I think Americans would respond to like, I mean, Americans are competitive, right? They want to have the best athletes in the world competing. Um, so I don't know, I, maybe that will happen at some point, maybe it won't. Um, I mean, football is weird because um, I was reading an article yesterday by like a AI researcher named Holden Karnofsky about um, why does utopia suck so much, right? Um, because there's like no competition, there's no risk, there's no like danger basically, right? And like, like football is an extremely violent sport, right? It's like much more violent than even hockey, which is a big contact sport, right? Um, a lot of former NFL players are not in good shape for the rest of their lives, right? Um, mm -hmm. But the NFL keeps doing really, really well in part because it's like, it's combat and in part because um, the more liberals rail against the NFL, the more conservatives will like it. So. I wouldn't make any predictions about football, but I think basketball's in pretty good shape. Um, soccer will continue growing. Um, baseball and hockey are, you know, not going away, but I think are in at least good shape. But it's hard to remember how much trouble football appeared to be in just six or seven years ago. What I'm saying, though, yeah. yeah. So now you wouldn't bet against football, I don't think. Not now, but, but six or seven years ago, a lot of people were saying that because of the concussion issue and because of other mistakes that the NFL had made, uh, failing to discipline... Uh, hyperactive players, et cetera, the, the, but it didn't turn out to be true. It just, it just is a blip. I look at the story. They have such good structure of one, one and done, any give like high variance to outcomes. I mean, they, they've, they've mastered the structure of the sport. They sort of stumbled into it, and the other sports stumbled into horrible structures of, you know, 82 games and you know, so, so it's long series that, that you know don't interest a huge swath of especially younger folks, like one and done is such a powerful thing. That's why Marjorie, you know, everyone start, you know, immediately gets interested in every college basketball team, unlike you, Bill, on March, you know, <laughs> 14th. They're like, oh, Davidson, oh, it's my team, you know, I've, because it's one and done. And, I, I, you know, look, we struggle on like, forecasting the future uh, when you say 2050, because we don't really know. Like, I think we all sort of map ahead and like say, okay, this should be this other soccer league, this should be this. So I don't know when, but like when I think about what sports will win, I think like what is the dominant thing that is winning right now and the dominant thing that's winning attention right now? There's nothing to beat the, the, the slot machine effect of scrolling 
one of the one of the major social media apps the 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 dopamine hits of l little videos delivered to you customized that that is winning that is gaining market share at a huge rate so what what sport will win that and what's or will will that itself be a sport will someone who would be good at like winning the slot machine of yeah, you know, yeah. delivered videos. Yeah, yeah. What 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 sport will most be able to leverage like that dopaminergic? Right. Kind yeah, of yeah. No, a, nobody nobody watches sports under thirty. They they just watch the highlights. They just do. I mean, it's yeah. just reality. It, there's like two things. I think the World Cup being here in a few years is going to have a step function impact in terms of interest. And what MLS just did with yeah. the Apple deal, I think is, you know, we, we have seen the impact of, of NFL being on Amazon Prime in terms of going younger. And so again, the difference here is that it, with the Apple MLS deal, people will have to pay for it. So this is a really, really interesting com component of it. But I, I th there will be a step function growth. The other thing I would say that we're kind of leaving out of the, out of the discussion right here is that I think women's sports is going to uh, rise in a really significant and meaningful way. And I'm very bullish on that. Um, and, and, and so I, will it, will it co com compete and compare to men's sports? Like I certainly hope so. Uh, absolutely. No, Absolutely. Not. Well, it has to. It, it, we can't go on. History changes. But I'd also, I also I strongly agree with that point. If you're investing in a sport, invest in a women's sport, that's, where the, that's the best bet. But, I, but I'd also point out, in 1979, my friend Dan Okrent visited me in Kansas, and he was explaining this new game he'd invented, which was fantasy baseball. <laughs> and, <laughs> but fantasy baseball, although we don't think of it as a sport, we think of it as a derivative product. It's a sport in itself. Mm -hmm. It's a sport sure. in which many millions of people compete, uh, and, and it has a acquiring a spectator uh, side to it. So, and how I got my start in sports was yeah. running, or one of the phone operators for Bill James Fantasy Baseball. So, is that, is that true? <laughs> that is one hundred percent true. Yes. Um, I wanted to. I, I sort of <laughs> mentally put a pin. <laughs> I was a fantasy phone operator. That is, <laughs> we'll need a demonstration here. Um, so I sort of mentally put a pin in something that Nate said about the risk of football sort of like inherently being part, or the inherent risk of football being part of the appeal of that sport, you know, as someone who has covered the NFL for a little while now, you know, health and safety was like, priority number one, two, and three, um, you know, I would say it, it's still, you know, a huge priority for the NFL. I was able to catch some of the AI panel right before this, and they mentioned health and safety on the AI panel. I am very fascinated by AI. I do think that there are lots of kind of like healthcare solutions that artificial intelligence will hopefully um, deliver for us. But my point in, in bringing that up is if AI, if healthcare AI could increase, say, the, the lifespan, or not the lifespan, but the career span of a football player, let's say the average career from three years to 30 years, Nate, would you be less interested in watching football? I mean, I'm not sure AI is going to do that. Um, what about 300 years? <laughs> I mean, I don't think player longevity is a problem per se, right? I mean, Tom Brady is probably career the most... longevity is what I mean. I'm not talking about actual. No, I think I think career longevity is good, and having fewer injuries would be like would be really good, right, for almost all sports, right? Yeah, totally. Um, I think having fewer injuries would be great for all sports, right? I mean, I wonder about AI, though, the effect on alternative forms of entertainment. Um, hmm. Like, AI-enhanced, like, video games are probably going to be really compelling, more so even than um, the products today. And, and on the one hand, there are some great sporting games that can increase it. On the other hand, if you would rather, like, play NBA 2K in this incredibly hyper-realistic world and be the athlete yourself um, instead of watching a Sixers game. I think that has like, that's- Oh, we'll be watching bag. Sixers games. Yeah, yeah, that's very important, <laughs> yeah. When you were, the danger of the NFL, are you saying people are pining for gladiator matches? Like that's like this yeah, like people evolutionary are, people are thing. People don't want utopia, they want competition, right? Um, but then they want violent competition is what you're saying. They want competition. I think one thing that sports does is channel the competitive impulse into less violent forms of competition. Right. Like I think like the Olympics and the World Cup are like actually probably quite good for like 
creating peace in the world and things like that. Football's a sport where it actually is quite violent. Um, but I was intrigued by what Bill said, that like, you, if, do you think if boxing hadn't fumbled and it mm. kept going, right. and then obviously it have sort of merged with UFC and all these other forms of right. you know, sort of more raw combat, that it would still be somewhere near the NFL today, do you think? <laughs> I think if it had handled that transition better, yes, it would still be a, a, a front page sport. Well, it's also pretty interesting, though, because what the NFL um, is really how they're trying to grow football is through flag football around the world, right? Yeah. And trying, in fact, I believe, to have flag football as an Olympic sport in LA 28. Um, I, th I believe just this past week in California, they uh, passed legislation to for flag football to be um, a high school a high school sport for boys and girls so like we're expanding who has access to to be playing um in some ways almost like it is a different sport and i would say for myself as you know a mom of of two young boys i'm much more likely to be like okay with them playing flag football than um obviously because of the concussions and and the concerns of that right. your point on the science side though is you're saying that if people get concussions it can I'm asking you, Michelle, I think oh. that if people get concussions... I'm like, please ask all your questions to Bill, please. <laughs> he's, right. he's much wiser. But, but you think that they'll be able to fix, address Perhaps. it? Perhaps. I mean, there. I think that the possibilities of AI, to me, at this point in time, seem uh, virtually limitless. And maybe there are healthcare uh, solutions, or maybe there is... You know, maybe there is a way for AI to read the entire human genome and essentially spit out, right, or your genome is in, and spit out like a customized micro pill mm. that will treat the exact issues, the exact problems that your or, body or has anything. to increase the longevity of your body. And relative to sports, where there are plenty of injuries, and certainly in football, you know, is there a healthcare, is there an AI healthcare? Um, Tra you know, training solution, you know, for the NFL's athletic trainers to use to fix a football body, right? And, and increase the longevity of those careers. It, at, at some risk of hijacking the discussion, I would argue that that which creates change is not uh, brilliance as much as it is stupidity. And so what you really ought to be, what we really ought to be I'm focusing- fighting words, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> what we really ought to be focusing on is what are the stupidest things that each of the major sports does? Well, in football, <laughs> the stupidest thing they do is to allow so many injuries. I mean, you, one should not get hurt while playing sports as a general rule. You get hurt in the preseason. Right. Yeah, yeah, that too. But the, um, Before the, the, games the stupidest start. thing that baseball does is to play so slowly that it's, it's gotten to be quite boring. The, the, the stupidest thing that basketball does is play so many games that, that each one has less impact than would be desirable, I think. The, uh, so the, then, then the issue becomes, to what extent is each of those things endangering? Baseball has endangered itself by failing to correct its obvious errors for a long time, and thank God we're finally moving on that. But to what extent does each of those... Uh, intellectuals tell me I shouldn't be using the word stupid. I don't think of stupidity <laughs> as a lack of intelligence. Weaknesses. I don't think of stupidity as lack of intelligence. I think of it as, a, as, a, as an active thing. Intelligence, um, a typical or no? It, <laughs> stupidity is an active thing. It's like a, a block. It's not. It's not like you're a, a weakness or a failing. It's like a block. It's like yeah. Uh, one going. One can see the right thing to do, but goddamn it, we're not going to do it. What are the? What are the? Sorry. What are the two stupid things though for um, soccer and and hockey? Because you're on a roll. Uh, isn't soccer inherently? <laughs> never mind. The. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Oh, no. Daryl has some thoughts, I think, on... No, I don't want to go to... Oh, soccer. fine. fine. <laughs> the, the soccer people hate me. So, <laughs> um, I wanted to ask Jessica, though, because women's sports going to grow. Will there be the opportunity for open or co-ed, whatever you want to call it, sports where men and women are playing together? In a, and will that be a form of sport? Because right now, obviously, with many of the sports, because of physical advantages or whatever... They're generally separated, often with different rules, which usually drive me crazy. But like, what, what I, do you see that? I'm, so I mean, if we were talking about the data that I think could maybe create some um, opportunity, what I've thought about is the mental side. I mean, you know that the the 
performance under pressure is something that I've studied for a really long time. I'm very passionate about it, is in part why we had this panel yesterday. Um, but I often wonder you know, about anxiety or stress or whatever pain tolerance. And if we could actually be tracking that data and then gamify it in some way at the end of games, um, where you know, you, if for example, someone had um, a very high stress level and uh, we could be tracking it, if they made a shot, it would be like a you know, money ball and it would count for more. Worth more if they're under stress. Yes, worth more if they're under stress. And, I, and, and so, I don't know, I'm just, I've been playing, I don't have an answer, but I think that, I, I hope that there can be more um, opportunities for women and men to play at the same time and for, for like- the, What would that sport look like? I, the, I just think the current construct of how we're um, tracking um, or you know, giving points, we can adjust it in certain ways that it, that it could be um, you know, more interesting. I, I mean, of course I love basketball, you know, as a, having been a basketball player. So, I mean, I, I just keep thinking about, it. it would be really fun to have a money ball type of a point at some point in the game. And, and you know, it doesn't need to be that it's based on gender, it could be based on these other characteristics that maybe today we can't see or track, but are really interesting. You know, we have soccer with you have you need to have six women and five men and they you get to allocate where you put right. them on the field. And you know, there are devices now. I mean, they can there there is a uh, enhanced MRI machine that can read the electric signals in your brain and like correctly deduce what you're thinking about. Well, that might be hard to use on the field. I You'd think. wear a helmet. <laughs> you wear the MRI helmet. And you'd okay. wear an MRI. Listen, we have a magic wand here, Daryl. Okay. okay, okay. <laughs> You wear an MRI, MRI helmet. I was talking to someone yesterday at the conference about this, and he was like, uh, you know, the issue there is that if fans could see the thoughts of players in the game, you know, the thoughts, it might be upsetting <laughs> or exciting or disappointing. To go back, the NBA can't fix their games problems because they're, we're in a local optimum and there's risk of exiting it. And no one, like, while the Golden Goose is spitting out billions in an amazing sport, no one wants to take the risk. So it takes a crisis like baseball to, to right. get to a new... That was, that was part of my point. It does take a crisis to fix a lot of problems. Uh, the problem with this machine that reads your head is it's either got to censor your sexual thoughts or... <laughs> <laughs> or uh, used to the fact that everybody has them all the time. One of the, mm. one of the two. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell Nate wants He's to jump in on that. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm like the technophobe here. I don't want a machine that reads my fucking thoughts. Jesus. <laughs> And I'm well, everyone Michelle. else does, Nate. It would help your Twitter everyone account. People would does. like you so much more if it just dumped your thoughts. <laughs> uh, and I worry about AI in some ways more than I'm excited about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. That was what, the last panel. Do you mind, Daryl, sharing what you tell your kids? What we talked about backstage, like, be careful because... Oh, I've told my kids since they were little that they probably won't die. So just make sure they're doing the right things in life. I think that's it, good advice. Yeah, it's very likely. I mean, like the advances that are in, you know, in de-aging, even de-aging, they're not even talking about stopping your aging. There's like in, in fairly high level carb, carbon-based life forms on earth, uh, you know, mice, they, they're de-aging right now. Now humans are way more complicated, so it may take a while, but so you'll see who us, knows? You'll we may, see maybe in time to save the 50 year olds and over, so. You heard it here first, Tom Brady's coming back out of retirement. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's gonna Benjamin <laughs> Button it. He's yes. gonna be like No, no, totally, he'll play, no. <laughs> he'll, play, he'll play football just as long as that like AI healthcare stuff kicks in and then he'll play for the next 400 years. Well, how, uh, how many wives will be on? Um, oh my God. <laughs> Uh, one thing that you mentioned, so like before I was a sports reporter, I was a business reporter and we would always report on insider buying and selling, right? So I, and I always used to say like, we shouldn't really cover selling as much because there's a million reasons why the CEO of a company or CMO or whoever wants to sell, like maybe they're buying a house or they need cash in another business, but there's only one reason to buy and it's because you think something is going up. So we're talking about sports that we're bullish on. Some of you on the panel may are investors. For instance, Daryl, you talked about League of Legends. 
uh, in this panel in 2020. <laughs> oh, you did? Yeah. I was going to say, what happened to that? What we doubled to that? it and so sold. In, in, in I still the year bullish, 2000, Daryl Morey in 2020 was a League of Legends investor. That's true. You were bullish on League of Legends. Still what bullish. Are you, what are you bullish um, on Did now? sell, though, but bullish but sold. <laughs> that can both, that can that Still bullish, yeah, sure, sure. And that, that's exactly my point, which is like there's a million reasons why people sell. But they can still be. Yeah, I, I'm still very bullish, sanguine. and I don't know which ones. Um, similar to my like dopamine scrolling thing, like it's going to be these super engaging games that win in the future. Uh, I don't know. I don't know which ones. So, you know, there's now going to be mobile League of Legends just games that already exist. So yeah, no, I think I don't know which one though. Like, or I'd I'd put the money in, and I did put money in others that didn't make it. That's part of investing. So. I mean, well, like I said earlier, I'm I'm bullish on women's sports in general because um, you know it generally hasn't gotten the awareness, and and I think that's changing just women's sports and the gist. And there's lots of um, organiz I mean, the athletic ESPN they're starting to really cover women's sports in a different way. So if I'm looking at women's sports, and you know, I obviously think soccer. Um, is, is a huge opportunity, but as a sport that is, is a lot of women, I believe, are, are playing is volleyball, I think is a really interesting. Why um, volleyball? I mean, well, I think, you know, it's funny because um, while basketball is incredibly uh, popular, I, I w when thinking about this panel, I was like, you know, volleyball is something that I think is coming. I didn't know the history of when it when it was invented and that it was also invented in Massachusetts, but it was four years after basketball. Um, Volley space ball. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it was but it was here in Massachusetts, and it was basically a counter to the like the pounding of basketball. And so as we're thinking about health was and there theory, women couldn't handle the pounding no 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 no. it wasn't it was it didn't start as a women's oh, okay. sport I'm just saying as a sport and we think about injuries and we don't really hear about I don't believe injuries in volleyball mm. um and so I and I think it's a it's a sport that's gaining in popularity in the United States I think it's it is just starting to have analytics around it. It's just really interesting to me, and I think it could potentially. It's played at a very high rate in high school. Because right. Because of Title, title Nine. Yeah, no. In college, yeah. Volleyball is, is a great sport. It, it really, I loved playing volleyball when I was young enough to move around. The, uh, and KU is, I mean, obviously we sell out every basketball game, but they also sell out every women's huh. volleyball game, and they're not a national power. It's just that people love, and, you know, it's. Hmm. 11,000 people, 1,000 seaters. Oh, it's not that big. I don't know how big it is. Anyway, but I know you can't get a seat. You can hardly get a seat there. Uh, the hell that fog? The same arena? It's just, it's like Next 20, 20 feet from the fog, yeah. The, uh, every game sells out, so. Well, there, I mean, and also there's like really, I mean, we're just, like we had um, the, the Caitlin Gow from um, Love B was, was here yesterday on the new leagues panel. Like there, there hasn't really been volleyball leagues. Uh -huh. um, I mean, we've had the, the like professional right. beach volleyball and stuff like that. So it's just there should be in women's volleyball. I think superior to men's. Why? If you watch the highest level Olympic volleyball, it is insane. They're all like seven three. It's like one one serve, one kill. One serve, one kill. One serve, one kill. It's very uninteresting. Oh. But like one level down is more interesting. There are some sports like that. Could, I think. could they solve that by moving the meta net up? Yeah, or down. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, <laughs> um, up. The, uh, <laughs> you know what, the great thing about basketball is, is that you, you handle the ball so often. I mean, in, in baseball, each player has like four at-bats a game and any, mm. any uh, five or six chances in the field to field the ball. And in, but in basketball, you, each player handles the ball like 100 times a game, mm. it, it, which makes, the, makes it analytically interesting, but also it, it just... It just this, the pace of the action is so great when it's when it's played at a high level. Nate, if you were a sports investor now, where where would you be putting your money? What are you bullish on? I mean, I guess I'm being redundant, but like I think soccer in the U.S. It just seems like maybe it's the World Cup here, uh, maybe it's more investment in the domestic league, but like um, the places where it's popular, it is a big deal. Um, and the fact that you've had, I mean, in this kind of social media age, the fact that all of a sudden, like, I see, like, a lot of, like, 
women's college volleyball clips tweeted, right? All of a sudden, I see a lot of like F1 fandom or Premier League fandom among American like hipsters, right? Like I think it's like, I think the shifts could be more rapid and that the chance of having like a tipping point where soccer takes off is, you know, it may not be totally linear. Yeah, you know, I think it kind of fits into what Daryl was saying with sports that will uh, fit in or, or at least be able to leverage that social media behavior, you know, the scrolling behavior that we all have. And social media is just about personality. It's not about stats. It's not about the score sheet or the box score. And what are the sports where athletes are using their personality? Like I, say, I think sometimes, you know, especially in this milieu where we're talking so much about data, sometimes the soft skills can be overlooked. And, you know, you mentioned F1, um, you know, drive to survive, right? Phen the drive to survive phenomenon and the personalities of those drivers sort of being so out there and the stories and the drama behind the scenes drove a lot of that interest in that sport, right? Like, I wonder if we sort of underrate personality in this, in this picture. Which and means the sports are gonna gent, like, engineer them more, for sure. Engineer personality. Engineer person, yeah, because like, you know, when it's like a Pete Sampras, or even when we're hmm. talking in chess, Fabiano Caruana was the first U.S. player to play since Bobby Fischer should have been a big deal. You know, amazing player, but he's 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 who he is. He's not, like Tim Duncan. There are these like players who were amazing players, but not personalities. But they drive a quite a le less interest. Yeah. And and what's interesting is the tension too between coaches are I think correctly trying to generate these team dynamics that are positive but they're almost completely at odds yeah. with generating these individual narrative storylines. Um, and so like what that tension will just continue to grow, I think. Can I ask a question? Do you, th do you think that sports suffer when too few people dominate them or too few organizations dominate them? I think that one reason, uh, well, uh, let's take auto racing and let Let's, let's ask the question, could auto racing explode to a yet higher, and auto racing has millions of fans, right? Uh, now, uh, while we don't talk about it at the same level, but it's a, it's a high level thing. The, uh, but could it if, it, if there were four times as many leagues, four times as many types of competition, would it explode more rapidly? Or when they, when it, it seems to me that when it's too co tightly controlled by too few people, Mm -hmm. That tends to inhibit its inherent. It's so you're arguing for more like the international model of sports, where like clubs can right. be formed and play at different levels, and it's and you can have relegation. Is that what you're uh, answering? Well, or no, I'm missing I, your point. I, th I think uh, if you look at, um, I think when fans potentially, it, it was a little bit of what Michelle was saying. But if I think if fans, if there's a really dominant team, meaning they win a lot, but they're not. Um, blowing everyone out, so it's still very competitive. But I think if people get those storylines about the athletes and they're like, oh, they're really compelling. I want to see what they do next and are they actually clutch and are they, or are they gonna fail? That, people will tune into that and, um, it, but, but it needs to be competitive. It's a blowout and the game isn't, isn't in question. Well, that's less interesting. So, I mean, if you look at some of the growth of particular leagues, I, I don't actually know this, but has it paralleled when um, a team has been dominant for an extended period of time, or won, I guess, a lot over an extended period of time, but, has, but, has, but it's been very close, like the games and the likelihood of winning is, I don't know. I mean, I think the NFL is the closest to that balance with the Patriots, for example, right, where, um, I mean, hockey and baseball are too fucking random with the playoff structure, right? Um, I mean, it's great. What are the no man? <laughs> like, what are the Bruins, which is one of the best regular season teams in years, right? Were they like twenty percent to win the Stanley Cup, like seventeen percent or yeah, something? Yeah, it's right? less than twenty. Like that's stupid. Um, you, you you want more certainty in your sports? You're I like, think oh, football, that's just so football, wrong. That's just wrong. I think wrong. Like where if you like a Tom Brady yeah. level franchise, right? You want people. You probably win a couple of championships, winning. but also in a given year, maybe you're. 40% or something like that to me seems like optimal for, for balancing these dynamics. You know, people want less certainty in knowing who's going to win when they tune in, not mm, more certainty. Yeah. 
I they weren't, but they weren't. But you want like storylines, right? Yeah. You want some predictability. If you're a casual fan, you want to tune in. If somebody turns in once a year to the NHL or NBA playoffs, right? You want to see like some teams that you recognize, because there are a lot of casual sports fans and players you recognize. So golf pre-Tiger Woods, like just there's a new random person winning. You hated that. Uh, you know, I mean, I've never been much of a golf guy, really. I mean, you don't want you don't want tennis. Although tennis, I mean, the tennis model, like having like these three uh, all-time great players whose career overlap. I mean. I think that was really great for, for tennis, but there are three and not one, which makes a big difference. Getting to, I think it was Jesse's point about storylines. Remember how captivated the country was by the uh, um, um, Lynn, Jeremy Lin phenomena? And it's this, the story was this kind of ordinary guy, ordinary prospect, all of a sudden was... One, ten in a row, ten, right. ten in a row, yeah. The, uh, or Tiger Woods. I mean, the, the country was so... I don't watch golf, but I'd watch... Or Bobby uh, Fischer. Uh, yeah. You know. yeah. So I, I do think that that is a, a valid point in understanding what it takes to cause a, a sport to take off, is there's got to be a... It's got to be designed in such a way that there's a storyline there that everybody can get into at some point. I think it's difficult to engineer those well, But I think but people will try. They're going to try because it's so important. And, you, and you know, like... like you're, you're in the media. They definitely engineer storylines. You know, let's be real, right? I, no, I didn't say that they couldn't engineer storylines. They have I meetings hard. to, like, say, okay, elite, what are we going to have trend? Elite-level media talent, Daryl. What's that? It, it requires elite-level media talent. Oh, absolutely. You need to pay them a lot, clearly. <laughs> oh, yes, but, absolutely. But, but, my, <laughs> but my point is, like, you have meetings where you decide what, what will be the big narrative. Maybe I should say it's harder to engineer personalities. It's harder to manufacture, you know, yeah. there's... Some guys have, have great personalities and interesting stories, and they want to share those things and want to put themselves out, and some people don't. I think that's one, um, you know, I think that's one challenge for hockey is I think the culture of hockey is kind of don't put yourself out there, you know? Don't but, but that's, do it. I mean, there's exceptions the to that. That's like every sport. The, the coaches are trying to manage this tension of, like, they're trying to create a team. Mm -hmm. They're trying to create a team environment that helps you win. And that's almost a directly opposite to the thing that drives interest in the sport and entertainment all, often. I, I think that the coaches who are successful, though, will evolve to uh, encor encourage and maybe even incentivize because they know that the game has changed. And at least from a recruiting perspective, those players do want to create their own brands, right? I mean, I don't think, an I mean, Andy Reid certainly didn't stop Travis Kelsey and Jason from doing their podcast the week of the Super Bowl. Preparing Draymond's done amazing stuff. Yeah, Draymond Green during the... Right. Yeah. Right. I think it's valid. Right. Yeah. Bill, do you think that, you know, you talked um, you talked earlier about baseball being a, a, in crisis and, and the pace of play. That's something you talked about through the years consistently. Is the pitch clock enough to cure what ails it? Uh, it isn't any one thing, but, but it's a step in the right direction. And, you know, I was asked on a different panel... Uh, whether we were moving too fast. And yeah, yeah, we're running too fast because we're trying to catch up from things that should have been done years and years ago. The, uh, yes, the pitch clock is going to help, but is it, is it, a, is it the last step that needs to be taken? No. I, I just actually I would love to get people saw. I've been thinking a lot about this year as this like year of the retirement of these like, I mean, icons, Brady, Serena, Bird, Federer, mm. and I'm and I, and I and I'm mostly just wondering, like, is this really all of these all-time greats retiring at the same time, or is it like, what are the changes that are going to be happening that are like going to create? Cre has this happened before? Is it the? I, it's just it seems so interesting and odd to me that so many of it happened this year. I don't have. I'm I'm going to look to the statisticians over here, but it's 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 like odd, right? It could be. Yeah. The uh, I remember we had a year in baseball about three years ago when there was a, a rush of deaths and it was the year before COVID, so it wasn't COVID, a whole bunch of highest level superstars died in one year. Uh, I think you just get clusters like that, hmm. that occur. Uh, it, it'll really be something if LeBron suddenly retires. Bill, is baseball structurally in trouble, in trouble no matter what they do? If, if baseball was invented five years ago, would it have any chance of breaking through to be one of our big hmm. sports? If it, yes, because if it had been invented five years ago, it would not have yet developed all of its bad habits. <laughs> really. Right, right, what, right. what happened is it yeah. just developed a lot of bad, bad habits, and because it had so many powers in play, 
you couldn't, it was hard to fix them. But it has all these structural things that even you said are bad, like the, the, like the, the right fielder stands for forever, doesn't touch anything. Right. You know, you, if I you didn't like, mention the right fielder. If right. you like simulated the world a thousand times, I think you wouldn't wind up with like a baseball like sport that often. That's exactly, pretty, that's, that's what I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. Like this yeah, is a soccer sport, like, almost always. I think. What are you doing with it? You're throwing. You're trying to hit it with a like, stick. Why round? Like that seems yeah. harder. You know, like yeah. like it'd be a whole set of things. You'd be like, no. Like, <laughs> um, Baseball played well is a, is a great sport. Well, of course, but so are any weird thing you could come up with to play well. Exactly. Like, the, the definition of sports are arbitrary. It's, yes, it doesn't have to be 90 feet. It could be 105. You could you could you could make up any number of new sports which in, in theory and in practice would be, would be just as exciting as, as the existing sports, but the only thing is they have no, they have no base, they have no fan base. And th that's what's wrong with the argument that the players are the game. The players are not the game, because if the, if the players were the game, you could, you could invent a new game that was, nobody had seen. It, you could invent it in such a way that's terribly exciting, but it would have no fan base. I think if you take the NBA players and throw them into a random game, they do the best. Like if you just pick X game, mm. the NBA players would just would do the translate worst. the Absolutely. worst. Absolutely, the NBA has the worst. <laughs> the NBA has the worst athletes of any any pro sport. What? Absolutely. <laughs> wait, wait. They're so big that they but they, they are look, the tallest. Yeah, sure. But what? Is, that's not an advantage. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Is an advantage. All right. No. No. How about swimming? <laughs> not, no, you're ready for ESPN, Bill. <laughs> Stephen A. was proud of that take. <laughs> I couldn't handle that much money. <laughs> uh, I like your simulate worlds. Like, if you just simulate the world, like, yeah, what sports do we have? have? A guys, so, like, we'd um, have a soccer type game for sure. Because in chess, right? You can come, what's it called? Chess 8, 7, whatever you can 960. Like, you go and you, like, randomly generate the rules, or poker will move toward yes. having, like, mixed games where the rule varies every time you go around the table, right? Maybe have, like, a sport where, like, you don't know what sport you're going to play until you show That's up. That's Calvin Ball, Calvin and Hobbs. Okay. Calvin Ball, yeah. Mm. Yeah. We're gonna get to some questions <laughs> from the audience. Show them like that angle. Mm. Yeah, that's my that's my default Let's move segue. On. We have questions mm. from the audience. Anyway. Save us questions. Uh, so Jessica, this is a question for you. When will a woman play in the NBA? Is the talent level there? Oh wow, that's a. Um, I don't I don't think we're too far away. I think it has more to do with rule changes. Um, I mean. I personally, no offense, Daryl, love the women's game much more than. Don't offend me. Because you work in the NBA. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I just, I love the the passing, the teamwork. I, I think the WNBA is a far superior product at this point in time. I love the women's college basketball. Um, I just think it's more pure actual basketball. Bill, I would would appreciate your thoughts on this too. It's. It's about like the passing and finding the open person, and there's much more teamwork in it than than what I see in in the NBA today. I, I we used for, for years we had season tickets to the women's games as well as the men's games, and we enjoyed the women's games very much for the reasons you point out. There is a purity uh, <laughs> and a a team orientation about it, which is is greater. But to, there was there's there's something really missing from the fact that so many people the the crowds are so small and it, it, it I think it's awareness uh, I think literally we have not been putting women's sports people don't know who the who the players are they don't they haven't connected the stories yet right. and so I think you know as we have more women helping to promote and maybe it's this direct to consumer component and people start following female athletes and and they're and it becomes I mean Women's tennis, I believe, is more popular than men's tennis, right? Because the the Serena Williams and Billie Jean King before her, like they were compelling personas. Um, we have we have an AI question. Will we see a future where AI slash robots, not at least not human, not human forms, right? So either artificial intelligence or perhaps some kind of physical robot, are competing? In yeah. televised sports or battle bots, sports. battle bots. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a real thing too. Uh, so I, I think this one's pretty straightforward. Yeah, a lot of sports have dealt with this tension. You know, the sports will either have just the one form, which is like we're going to try and just have you know, you know, us humans, 
with as few enhancements as possible. They'll just have their genetic advantages and training over time. Uh, but then there may be other versions of each sport where you're allowed to have bionics, enhancements, genetic engineering. You can use PEDs. You can, right, it's sort of F1, NASCAR. In F1, you can do a lot of advanced things. NASCAR, everyone gets sort of the same car. I think we'll, we'll, you always have the NASCAR version of every sport, and then sometimes you'll have like a version where you can use any enhancement you can come up with, like a bionic leg or whatever. I would, I would short that idea aggressively. Which, which part? Which one? A, the also. idea that, first of all, the idea that like, like robotics, um, AI is not, is way, way, way behind uh, physical tasks as opposed to mental tasks, right? They are much mm. harder. That's a part of the human brain. By the way, a lot of brain is devoted toward movement. Um, that if you don't actually reverse engineer the human brain, that symbol manipulation doesn't work nearly as well. So that, number one. And number two, like, in some ways, I think AI will create more value for like, human art forms, right? That the fact that like, um, anyone can make like, a coherent like, rock song using AI means that my identity as a creator becomes more valuable, right? So I think in some ways, like professional athletes who A, have like athletic skills that we probably will take a long time for robots to recreate, and B, have personalities and connection with people, I think that's actually quite robust for, I think, for elite professional athletes. I might get put out of a job, but like LeBron James will not be. But, so Nate, how long will it be before you, uh, we have AI that can write a paper you can submit to an MIT class that won't immediately be... <laughs> be detected by your teacher. Well, that's oh, now. like now, Sorry, yeah. Now. I don't know. I, no, now. Every, every, I live in an academic community. Everybody who gets those things knows immediately that they're false. Now. By a show yeah. of I, I, who has used ChatGPT to write a paper? Wow. OK. Did you get by with it? I mean, AI can write like a college freshman. I mean, Bill, have you done it? Uh, the, uh, have you I, I, what, what did you write you, a paper were, for? For, he writes I, I applied for a talent visa for a friend who needed to write some bullshit <laughs> two-page thing, like why they're talented to get a visa to another country, and it wrote it, and for sure it checked the box. Like, have you, have you, have you actually used ChatGPT to write a paper? You will no. be convinced the moment you do it that it will pass many professors. Well, students tend to think it's going, this is going to get by the... But first of all, there's now a counter a counter AI. Not yet, not you, for that. you submit that to the counter AI, and it will say That's yes. That's coming. Yeah. No, it's not coming. It, they are the teachers well, are. They have it, that. but it's losing to ChatGPT right now. No, it? it isn't. The, uh, the ChatGPT is losing to the to the counters. You. No, it first is. of all, everybody, every professor I know gets those things regularly, well, let's talk about and it. they spot them. <laughs> they spot them like yeah, that. Yeah, I know and, about those. They are behind. It's a spy versus spy, and they're behind right now. Well, and also you can like go, you come back, you're out in college, you come back home from a late night, right? And you're like, shit, I have to file my paper by nine in the morning, right? So then you give it a prompt, and then you edit it a little bit. You add a few yeah. errors, you add a little bit of personality, right? Um, right. And the AIs will get better and get better at like responding to instructions. So I think homework is kind of fucked. Can we, can we have an audience? <laughs> they shouldn't have had homework in the first place. I agree. Yeah. So yeah. Check that out. Can we have an audience poll here? How many people agree with Daryl that the, the cheater, cheating AI is going to, is going to win this debate? Uh, could, could we have a round of applause for, for Daryl's position? <laughs> uh, and how many, how many people agree with me that, it, that, it, that uh, it's still not there? Can I, can I say one thing? Oh, sure. So, so, so to me, the, it is not something necessarily, though, to be like, don't use it. It's actually something to be embraced because it's going to create efficiency for how it, certain things that we are spending time doing today, we will not be spending time doing because we will be leveraging the AI and we, we will be asking it to do things based on our knowledge and we'll be doing more um, meaningful uh, tasks. So, I mean, I don't really think it's any different than... Right, like next year, it won't be me here, it'll be Clippy. <laughs> no, but it's like, I mean, it's like Excel. Like, you used to use a calculator, now you None of us are looking forward to that, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, we got to go, like, kind of lightning speed here. Um, are you bullish or bearish on the future direction of college athletics? I mean... I, well, I'm a huge fan of Charlie Baker, so if anyone can fix it, it's him. 
Um, I, it, He's it, the new it, president of the NCAA. Yes, yep. thank, thank you. I don't even that. know what college athletics are, so. I'm uh, very <laughs> bullish. I, Oh. Very bullish. I, I think I think that that the the football component of col of college sports needs to be addressed. It technically operates outside of the NCAA, but the NCAA is um, is basically deals with all of the risks of football. So if there's lawsuits that are brought for um, football injuries, the NCAA is dealing with that, not the people who are making all the the money, which is largely the Power Five. So uh, I think that being solved will be. Um, will be better for the college football. We have college. another, we have on another colleges eight. universities though. I mean like college enrollments are declining mm. in the US, especially among men. Um, that seems not great, right? Um, and yeah, right. I guess, I guess oh, it could you know, be maybe bullish in the immediate, immediate. Well, maybe, but like different training methods are going to be far superior. So I think there is, I mean, partly it's affordability issues, right? Partly it's uh, a certain type of thought leader thinks that like college is not the ideal way to train people or there are more alternatives, right? But like, I think, you know, um, you know, college football teams are having trouble filling out the stands and if you have fewer alumni because more people don't go to college, then, mm. then that can cause problems. Uh, last question here, how do we use chat GPT? Another chat GPT question, very popular. I mean, that is, you know, about that, that is what 2023 is about thus far. How do we use AI ChatGPT to promote female athletes in a positive way to advance women's sports? How can we use it for good, right? Data for good. I would just, you know, the narrative generator, it's really like the interest in women's sports will go up when there's compelling personalities and compelling sports. And again, like if you just want something to, create narratives. In fact, on our last panel, someone was doing that for the Fox hosts. I was like, okay, that explains a lot of the bad takes, you know? <laughs> and so, yeah, right. you know, again, like we're narrative creatures. And so can you design a sport through AI where men and women have like their different skills balance out perfectly? Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Feels like it. Uh, in the great, in the words of Kevin Garnett, Anything is possible. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming to the final panel of Sloan.